Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about human rights and government policy. Welcome back, everyone. It is April 15th, it, and on a Wednesday, and we have updates from uh, John Horgan, um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, um, and federal health health administrators and officials, and along with uh, Carly Quadro, and we also have an update from... Uh, Adrian Dix and uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry. Uh, towards the end of the show, I had a had a brief conversation with a dementia expert and consultant, uh, Karen Tyrell. Uh, Karen uh, also uh, has helped develop a um, dementia village in Langley, BC, and she's going to give us some. Some words of hope and uh, maybe some some uh, steps that we can take so that our loved ones are locked down in uh, care homes, and you know we just want to be able to communicate with them. And she's going to have has some some um, tips and and some some things that that just so you know that. Our loved ones in, the, in these care homes are safe, they're well, and being taken care of. So uh, let's get on with um, John Horgan. John Horgan, he, of course, he he wants to thank everyone in British Columbia for a uh, successful um, Easter weekend. And um, he also... He also wants to, to uh, assure us that things things are working and that um, eventually we will hear from um, Adrian Dix and Dr. Bonnie Henry about how the model is actually working for uh, for BC and that um, the self isolation plans uh, when coming back into Canada was working only uh, out of. 4,400 people, um, only 84 actually needed to be housed by the federal government uh, for 14 days. So um, let's get on with what uh, John Horgan had to say. Uh, good morning, or pardon me, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, just finished uh, the weekly cabinet meeting. Uh, I wanted to um, provide an update uh, for the gallery and for British Columbians. Firstly, I want to uh, acknowledge that we're here on the uh, territory of the Lekongan speaking people, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. And I want to thank the vast majority of British Columbians who, over this past long weekend, managed to find some time to be with their families, managed to do so in a way that kept themselves away from their neighbors, kept themselves away from other British Columbians. It was a wonderful weekend, and we have more weekends ahead of us. But it was uh, a celebration, it seems to me, of what we've been able to accomplish as a community. And Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will be providing an update on our modeling here in British Columbia later in the week. And I'm hopeful uh, that when British Columbians see the progress that we have made collectively on flattening the curve, again, uh, we have a few days to go and Dr. Henry uh, is overseeing that project. Uh, I, I believe that people have cause for genuine celebration and a pat on the back collectively and virtually, uh, I should say, uh, for the work that we've done together to uh, flatten the curve. But we still have more work to do, and therefore uh, the Cabinet today uh, reaffirmed uh, the state of emergency, extending it for another two weeks, um, ensuring that all British Columbians stay the course. We all focus on the task at hand, and that is uh, protecting ourselves, protecting our families, protecting our communities uh, from this uh, scourge of a virus and the pandemic that is seizing the entire world. And it's always useful to remind ourselves that it's not just British Columbia, it's not just Canada, it's not just North America that is gripped by this. It is a, a global challenge. And therefore, when we look at all of the issues that are before us, we need to do that locally. 
We need to look at it provincially, and then we need to look across the country and then around the world as we come out from, the, from underneath this. I want to acknowledge the good work of uh, public uh, employees here in British Columbia working with uh, federal officials at our border crossings since uh, we implemented our plan to ensure that every uh, British Columbian returning to BC had a self-isolation plan. 4,700 travelers have come back. Uh, they've filled out the appropriate forms, and only 84 of those 4,700 are in quarantine, uh, being supervised by the federal government. Our border plan is working. I'm grateful for the help we've had across the way from local communities, from the Public Health Office, of course, and also the federal government. But the challenges remain, and we need to focus over the next couple of weeks on maintaining the course, ensuring that we're doing everything we can to stay distant from each other, to continue to wash our hands as much as we possibly can, try and not touch your face. Those who are essential to our economy continuing to move, particularly those frontline health care workers, again, our, our thanks. Uh, every night at 7 o'clock, my spouse and I and my neighbors are out banging pots to make some noise for you, and thank you for that um, that important work that you're doing. We had the uh, local uh, firefighter with his siren going last night, and I hope that it's going to be a regular occurrence. And if you can hear us in Lankford, you can hear us in, in Lanceville, you can hear us right across British Columbia. Okay, next up is the uh, Canadian health officials, uh, including Dr. Tam and uh, Carla Quadro. Um, so let's move on with what they have to say. Nice. We know that many Canadians are struggling to make ends meet. That is why today the Prime Minister announced that we're expanding our support for the Canadians who need it most. My colleague, Carla Qualtro, will elaborate on this in a moment. Je sais qu'aujourd'hui les Canadiens ont de la difficulté à joindre les deux bouts. C'est pourquoi je suis heureuse de pouvoir dire que nous assouplissons les critères d'admissibilité pour la PCE. Les Canadiens et Canadiens sont résilientes. Nous allons passer à travers ensemble. So today we are going to hear from Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, Canada's Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, le Dr. Howard New, our Minister of Health, Patty Haidu, by video link, our Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion, Carla Qualtro, et bien sûr, le Président du Conseil du Trésor, Jean-Yves Duclos. Dr. Tam, please. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. I'll start, as usual, with our update on the number of COVID-19 cases in Canada. There are now 27,557 cases, including 954 deaths. These numbers change again throughout the day. For the lab testing, we've completed tests for over 462,000 people, with about 6% confirmed positive, as Canada continues to improve our testing to better track where the disease is spreading. As Canadians continue to practice physical distancing, we are closely monitoring for signs that our efforts are having an impact on the epidemic curve. It's taken just over three months for the first cluster of COVID-19 cases in China to spread globally and establish the pandemic. It is hard to take in how our lives have changed in such fundamental ways over this short period. At this point, we still don't have all the answers, but there is some cause for cautious optimism coming from our epidemiological data. Because COVID-19 is very contagious, even a few cases can quickly multiply resulting in a steeply rising epidemic curve. This type of increase is referred to as exponential growth, with case numbers doubling every few days. In late March, when the growth rate was the fastest, we saw case numbers doubling every three days. But in recent days, we've observed a doubling time of over 10 days. This means the epidemic is slowing down. Though we all wish this could be a sprint to the finish, it is not. This will be a marathon, and there are no rewards for quitting early. To use another analogy, coming down from this epidemic curve will be like making our way down a mountain in the darkness. We mustn't rush or let go of our safety measures, or the fall will be hard and unforgiving. We need to remind ourselves that this is an emerging disease and that we don't know everything, so the terrain will be uncertain. That means we need to go slowly and be sure of our footing before taking each new step on the way down. Along the way, 
We'll need to closely monitor cases and growth trends to ensure we've got the right public health measures in place to detect and quickly respond to any new cases or clusters. We'll also need to maintain physical distancing during this time. Any break in our resolve could spark a new outbreak and delay our progress. So let's maintain our collective resolve and crush this curve. Thank you. And Carla Quadro. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Hello, bonjour. Comme je, je l'ai dit depuis le début, nous nous sommes engagés à soutenir tous les travailleurs touchés par la COVID-19. C'est pourquoi nous avons mis en place la prestation canadienne d'urgence. We recognize that under the current design, some workers don't qualify for the CERB, but are still in need of financial assistance, which is why we're extending the eligibility criteria for this benefit so that it's more inclusive. As announced by the Prime Minister this morning, we are expanding the eligibility of the CERB to allow workers, including self-employed, to earn up to $1,000 per month while still collecting the CERB. To include workers who recently exhausted their EI benefits and are unable to find a job because of COVID-19, and to include seasonal workers who have exhausted their EI benefits and are unable to undertake their usual seasonal work as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. Ces changements témoignent des différentes réalités auxquelles font face les travailleurs canadiens à l'heure actuelle. Nous savons que les gens souhaitent demeurer sur le marché du travail mais on veut une baisse considérable du nombre d'heures travaillées et des pertes de revenus à cause de la COVID-19. The changes announced today will increase the number of workers we can help, including those who still have some income, but not enough now to make ends meet. The CERB will give them the extra support they need. We also know that Canadians, including many seasonal workers who have been collecting EI, may not have jobs to return to and are anxious as their EI benefits have either already run out or will run out soon. These people also need our support and will now be eligible for the CERB. We also want to ensure that our essential workers are supported during this critical time. They are working day in and day out to, at our hospitals, assisted living care facilities, senior and long-term care homes, and we know the sacrifices you're making to keep us and our loved ones safe. That's why the Prime Minister also announced that he and Minister Marneau are working with the provinces to provide a temporary top-up to salaries for our essential workers making less than $2,500 a month. Nous savons qu'il s'agit d'un moment difficile pour beaucoup d'entre nous, et nous continuerons à chercher des manières de faire en sorte d'aider tous les Canadiens pendant cette période difficile. Je serai heureuse de répondre à vos questions. Merci, thank you. Okay, thank Next up from British Columbia, Dr. Bonnie Henry and Adrian Dix. 561. That includes 670 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 623 in the Fraser Health Region, 92 on Vancouver Island Health, 146 people in the Interior Health Region, and 30 people in the Northern Health Region. We have no new long-term care facility outbreaks, but there are ongoing outbreaks at 21 long-term care and assisted living facilities in uh, Fraser Health in Vancouver Coastal. And currently we're up to 265 cases associated with those outbreaks. We also have an ongoing outbreak in uh, uh, a nursery in the interior health and we have three additional cases who have tested positive in that outbreak, bringing the, the total number with uh, uh, test positive in that uh, cluster to 26. We continue to have the single case at the Okanagan Correctional Facility and ongoing management of that uh, facility is, is going. As well, we uh, are now up to 48 cases associated with the Mission Federal uh, Correctional Facility in the Fraser Valley, um, including seven people from that facility who are hospitalized in, in hospital here in British Columbia. Of, uh, of the cases we have, 131 people are hospitalized, and of those, 59 people are in critical care or ICU in the province. We have, unfortunately, another three deaths um, in the last day here in British Columbia to bring our total of people who have died from COVID-19 to 75. That includes, for the first time, a, a death in the interior health region, a man in his 60s 
who uh, had been in, in recovery at home. Um, 955 people are now fully recovered from COVID-19 here in British Columbia. I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing, the hard work we've been doing to ensure the needs uh, of all communities across the province have been addressed when it comes to preparing for and being able to respond effectively to cases of COVID-19. We recognize and have recognized from the beginning that every community is unique and they have different needs, both health care needs, um, essential service needs, and they require different levels of support. And particularly our smaller communities and more remote and First Nations communities may have limited res uh, resources and services, makes it much more challenging to address COVID-19, both in preventing it from entering those communities and responding. We know this, uh, this is especially great in some of our uh, more remote and, and First Nations communities. One thing that we do all have in common across the province and has been driving our response to this, this uh, pandemic is that we share our, our understanding and the value of our elders and seniors. And that is why we have been paying so much attention to what we can do to best protect them and to protect all of those who are more vulnerable to more severe illness around the province. So resources are being re, um, created to support communities around the province, provide them with the resources they need. And importantly, um, we talked about some of the testing strategies that we have, and we have been able to deploy testing um, to better support uh, our communities, our more remote and uh, uh, Indigenous communities around the province. And that's something that I think is going to be incredibly important for us to be able to detect cases early, to detect clusters of cases, and to appropriately and safely manage um, in these communities. One of the other things that has come to my attention in the last little while is that there have been concerns, and I've mentioned this before, that people are fearful of going into hospital or seeking medical care for the issues that they have um, that are not related to COVID-19. And part of that is the concerns that we have been putting in all of this preparation around um, being able to care for people who do have this disease. It is safe to go to the hospital. And I want to reassure people that if you have diagnostic tests that have been booked, that you've been waiting for, it is safe to go for those. It is safe to call 911. If you need that urgent medical care, do not hesitate to call for help if you need it. As well, we want to make sure that we are doing our best to protect people in our community from all of the other issues that arise um, that may affect our health. In particular, we, I want to encourage people of young children, parents of young children, to make sure that they continue with their childhood immunization programs. These are critical programs that we are preserving within our public health communities to make sure that, that young children in particular receive their basic immunizations and their childhood immunizations. So please um, be reassured that these services are still available to you and it is still incredibly important to protect our children from the other infectious diseases that we know can spread in our communities. And finally, we have been receiving and I've been talking a lot about uh, the importance of us being kind and supporting each other. We are in this together and we are in the midst of it still. We'll be presenting some of the modeling about where we are in the midst of it and some of the thinking that we have about going forward. But we are not at the point yet where we can let up and I know that is very challenging for people. And we've heard some anecdotes mostly of people getting frustrated and angry and I think we have to realize that this is often a manifestation of anxiety and fear that we have, not knowing about the future, not knowing what's going to happen with our jobs, not knowing what's going to happen with our families, being affected by not being able to see our loved ones. And I, um, this is a time where we really need to stand together to support each other, to respond to anger with kindness to make sure that we can support each other as we go through the coming weeks and months because we are all in this together. What we do today and what we do every day through this really matters. We are all making a difference and we are um, getting through this together. 
We are supporting our health care workers. We're supporting people who are caring for this virus. And we need to continue to support each other in our communities to make it through this. We need to be kind and we need to be calm and to help each other and stay safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And uh, I wanted to start by, by joining uh, Dr. Henry in expressing our condolences to the families of those who have passed away from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. One, as Dr. Henry has said, in, in the Interior Health Authority, one in Vancouver Coastal Health and one in Fraser Health. These are uh, significant losses. We understand uh, families will be grieving. And I think uh, they tell us in the most profound way possible why we do have to be kind and pull together because um, there are some people who uh, uh, are either directly or uh, through a family member or from taking care of someone uh, associated with that grieving. And, and I want uh, everybody to know that uh, we not only extend our condolences, we uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Henry and I um, reflect on it every single day before we come down here. The cost of this for many individuals who have lost loved ones so far. And uh, I wanted to note that um, as we do to talk about the acute care sector, uh, 131 people in, in acute care hospitals today, of which uh, 68 are in Fraser Health, 11 in Interior Health, 9 in, on Vancouver Island, 4 in the Northern Health Authority, and 39 in Vancouver Coastal Health that we have 4,632 uh, vacant hospital beds. That's a capacity level closer to 59 percent, uh, close to 59 percent. And then in critical care units, we have an occupancy rate of 46.3 percent. Wanted to add to the data I gave about surgeries yesterday that um, there was one data point missing from one health authority. In fact, we've completed in the period in question, which was March 16th, April 12th, 9,552 um, urgent and emergency surgeries, so urgent elective and emergency surgery, and so that we've can well we've cancelled uh, uh, many surgeries that are elective surgeries. There continues to be work done in our healthcare system. Equally, yesterday there were 3,595 emergency room visits across BC. This compares to 6,559 on March 9th, so it's significantly under, and it reinforces. Um, what Dr. Henry has just said to you, which uh, uh, statistically, which is that um, it is safe to go to the hospital and there will be there people there to help you if you have uh, conditions or need to, uh, to either do a diagnostic test or uh, receive care, emergency care in our health care system. So that's an important point to recognize. The work continues in long-term care and I just wanted to, to reach out to everyone again who works in long-term care. Um, there were, as, as we've said, no, f no further deaths in long-term care, but we continue to face a significant issues around long-term care and not just issues around people with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We understand, I think, very much the impact um, in a personal way, but also uh, in looking at the changes that have been made to protect people, the consequences of that. People do uh, pass away from things other than COVID-19 in long-term care. And one would hope that they would be surrounded, of course, in those times by family members. And that is not always possible now. And so we want everybody to understand that there is a cost to these measures. And while the measures, I think, are absolutely necessary, and the evidence shows they're absolutely necessary, and they're some of the strongest that have been taken anywhere, uh, we understand with all measures that are taken to protect people that they are not without cost. And we wanted to reach out, and I particularly want to reach out to all the families of people who have relatives, loved ones, friends in long-term care, that we understand how difficult this time is. I also want to acknowledge all of the health sciences professionals that are working uh, uh, across the system. We think of respiratory therapists, but so many more across health sciences professions who are doing remarkable work in supporting people both with COVID-19 and acute care and other patients in what is a very difficult time. I want to let people know over the next week there are going to be five uh, uh, virtual down uh, town halls, one in each health authority. They'll be hosted by um, members of the legislature from the, uh, the uh, NDP and from the opposition. Each, each will have a co-host and each will involve with the CEOs 
of the health authorities and the medical officers of health. The first one will be Friday, April 17th in Vancouver Coastal Health and when it will involve Mary Ackenhusen, Dr. Pat Bowen Ma MLA and John Yap MLA and there will be regions have. We also want to acknowledge the work that essential service providers have and I also want to acknowledge and uh, all the people, all people with disabilities in the province and so that they, they understand that, uh, that services and supports will be there for them if they require acute care services related to COVID-19, that their concerns are, are of significant importance both to uh, people who work with people with disabilities every day and to the healthcare system in what's a difficult mm -hmm. time and that we are focused on their, their concerns and sometimes their circumstances which require, um, uh, require special treatment, for example, uh, the need to ensure in hospital for people who have uh, hearing or sight disabilities may have more need for support in hospital from people who are regularly there to support them and we are absolutely working on all of those questions. On Friday we'll be presenting modeling and I wanted to just say uh, finally just a word about that. Uh, we won't be uh, doing a briefing tomorrow but we will be providing all of the information that you have come to that you come to expect every day with respect to new cases. But with respect to modeling, I want to say this, that what we're trying to do and what we've tried to do from the beginning is why we were the first uh, province to present uh, modeling, why uh, Dr. Henry and the De Deputy Minister Stephen Brown gave a detailed technical briefing some weeks ago and why we're updating it now. We want everyone to understand and see what we're seeing. This is not a turning point day. There isn't major changes coming out of what we do Friday. It's just our continuing effort to ensure, as I said, that you see what we see. And what we see is people around British Columbia who are taking part, who are participating, who are all in, who are helping to bend the curve. And now more than ever, as we see, I think, some positive indications about that and some challenges. You look at the mission institution, you look at other circumstances around the province and you see what can happen um, uh, in, uh, in circumstances and in communities of people uh, when COVID-19 is present. So we have to continue to, our work continue to be 100% all in. But I want to acknowledge every person in the province who have been part of this effort that uh, Dr. Henry and Mr. Brown and so many others have led writing the modeling and to acknowledge that you, when we do models and we present what the circumstances are in BC, we see your effort, your commitment, your work, and yes, your sacrifice. And if anything, what we need to do as this is working to a degree is to continue to be 100% all in in this effort in British Columbia. And I wanted to thank everybody out there for that. Okay, now we have a um, um, morning message from uh, Justin Trudeau. And he also talks about a, opening a mental health portal and how some benefits, as you heard from Carly Quadro, say how uh, uh, the CERB benefits can be extended uh, to help even more people than it already is. So let's move on to hear what Justin Trudeau has to say. Bonjour tout le monde. Before I get started, I want to take a moment to recognize Canadians who are doing some of the toughest jobs in the country. The women and men working in our hospitals, our seniors' homes, and our long-term care facilities are making sacrifices every day. If you do one of these jobs, thank you. Thank you for keeping us safe and healthy and protecting our loved ones. You deserve our full support. So if you need a hand getting through these tough times will be there for you. Today, we're announcing more help for more Canadians. This includes topping up the pay of essential workers. At the same time, we'll also be expanding the Canada Emergency Response Benefit to reach people who are earning some income, as well as for seasonal workers who are facing no jobs, and for those who've run out of EI recently. And a little later, I'll have some news about where we are with testing. Au Parlement, vous m'avez entendu parler des contributions de la plus grande génération, celle qui a grandi durant la Grande Dépression et qui s'est battue pendant la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Aujourd'hui, 
À travers le pays, les derniers membres de cette génération vivent dans des résidences pour personnes âgées et des établissements de soins de longue durée. La vérité tragique et dérangeante, c'est que les endroits même où on s'occupe de nos aînés sont particulièrement vulnérables à la COVID-19. C'est un sujet que je vais aborder avec les premiers ministres durant notre discussion qui aura lieu demain soir. On doit tous faire mieux. On doit tous faire preuve de leadership pour soutenir les aînés qui ont bâti ce pays. Pour commencer, notre gouvernement va travailler avec les provinces et les territoires pour augmenter les salaires de nos travailleurs essentiels qui gagnent moins de 2 500 dollars par mois, comme ceux de nos établissements de soins de longue durée. You heard me speak in, speak in Parliament about the contributions of the greatest generation who grew up during the Depression and fought through the Second World War. Today, across the country, the last members of this generation live in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. The uncomfortable and tragic truth is that the very places that care for our elderly are the most vulnerable to COVID-19. I will be addressing this with premiers tomorrow night. We all need to do better. We all need to take leadership for the seniors who've built this country. Our government will work with the provinces and territories to boost wages for essential workers who are making under $2,500 a month, like those in our long-term care facilities. For many workers looking after the most vulnerable Canadians, including seniors and those with disabilities, we know conditions have gotten more difficult over the past weeks and you need support right now. Tomorrow, in our weekly meeting, I will discuss with provincial and territorial leaders the importance of getting this wage boost in place as quickly as possible. As we face an unprecedented threat to public health, you are our most important line of defense. We will do whatever we can to help you do your job and support you through this time. En mars, notre gouvernement a instauré la prestation canadienne d'urgence. Cette mesure fait partie d'un plan qu'on a mis en place pour veiller à ce que tout le monde ait l'aide nécessaire pour traverser cette période difficile. Des millions de personnes ont déjà reçu la prestation, mais on sait que bien du monde n'est pas admissible. Il y a toujours besoin d'aide. Donc, aujourd'hui, on va assouplir les critères d'admissibilité pour permettre à encore plus de gens de bénéficier. Si vous gagnez 1000 dollars par mois ou moins, vous pourrez maintenant recevoir la prestation canadienne d'urgence parce que bien des gens ne travaillent pas autant d'heures qu'avant et d'autres doivent s'adapter aux réalités du travail à la pige ou à contrat. Les travailleurs qui ont épuisé leurs prestations d'assurance emploi récemment pourront aussi recevoir la prestation. Et à travers le pays, beaucoup de gens n'auront pas de travail saisonnier cette année à cause de la pandémie. Et donc la prestation canadienne d'urgence sera là pour eux aussi. C'est aussi un contexte difficile pour les artistes et les créateurs à travers le pays. Les lieux culturels sont fermés et le travail se fait plus rare. Le ministre Guilbeault a entendu les artistes qui demandaient que les droits d'auteur pour le travail fait avant cette crise ne soient pas inclus pour accéder à la prestation canadienne d'urgence. Et c'est ce qu'on va faire. Alors, en ces moments anxieux, les artistes continuent à nous faire réfléchir, à nous faire rêver et à mettre un peu de soleil dans nos quotidiens et nous leur en sommes toujours reconnaissants. Today, I can announce that we are expanding the Canada Emergency Response Benefit to include people making up to $1,000 a month, seasonal workers, and people whose EI has recently run out. Maybe you're a volunteer firefighter or a contractor who can pick up some shifts, or you have a part-time job in a grocery store. Even if you're still working or if you want to start working again, you probably need help in making ends meet. So if you earn 
$1,000 or less a month, you will now be able to apply for the CERB. If you were expecting a seasonal job that isn't coming because of COVID-19, you'll now be able to apply. And if you've run out of EI since January 1st, you can now apply for the CERB as well. And for others who still need help, including post-secondary students and businesses worried about commercial rent, we'll have more to say to you very soon. No matter who you are or where you live, we're in your corner. Après avoir accepté une première demande d'aide des Forces armées canadiennes pour le Nunavik, le gouvernement du Québec nous a envoyé une deuxième demande pour la base Côte-Nord. Je peux vous confirmer que ce sont les Rangers canadiens qui vont aller leur prêter main forte. After having accepted the first demand for help from the Canadian Armed Forces for Nunavik, the government of Quebec has sent us a second request for Basse Côte Nord. I can confirm that the Canadian Rangers will be there to provide support. I want to thank our women and men in uniform and the families who serve alongside them for all that they do. Whenever we need you most, you're always there for us. Par moment, on peut se sentir dépassé par les événements. On est dans une situation qui peut paraître irréelle et c'est pas toujours facile de composer avec tout ce qui se passe autour de nous. Cette semaine, le gouvernement lance un portail qui rassemble toutes les ressources en matière de santé mentale qui sont à votre disposition. Vous pouvez aller au canada.ca ou utiliser l'application Canada COVID-19 pour parler à quelqu'un. Il n'y a aucun gêne à se sentir comme ça. L'important c'est d'aller chercher de l'aide. If you're feeling overwhelmed, know that you aren't alone. And there are people who can help. We have launched a mental health portal at Canada.ca and through the Canada COVID-19 app, where you can go to find support. So if you need to, please reach out. We'll be there for each other. Finally, we have more news today to share on testing. Lumen Ultra from New Brunswick, with whom we signed a contract, is now ramping up production to supply enough COVID-19 test chemicals to meet the weekly demand in all provinces. And in the last few days, we received a new batch of swabs to make sure every province has the supplies they need to keep testing. Whether it's reagents or test kits, we are ensuring that Canada has the tools to fight this virus. Tomorrow, I'll also be speaking with the other G7 leaders about continuing to coordinate a strong and effective global response to this pandemic. L'entreprise Luminultra du Nouveau-Brunswick est en train d'augmenter sa capacité de production de façon à fournir assez de produits chimiques pour effectuer les tests de COVID-19 qu'il faut faire à chaque semaine dans toutes les provinces. Et au cours des derniers jours, on a reçu plus d'écouvillons pour les provinces. Je sais que tout le monde veut savoir quand est-ce que la vie va reprendre son cours. Et la réalité, c'est qu'on ne peut pas vous donner une date précise. Mais voici ce qu'on sait. Pour que ça se termine, il faut rester chez vous. Il faut limiter nos déplacements le plus possible et garder une distance de deux mètres avec les autres. Et si tout le monde fait sa part, on va passer à travers ensemble. Merci. Okay, so I had a conversation um, with uh, Karen Tyrell. Um, she is a dementia uh, consultant and she works with a number of places uh, to help improve care for those who have dementia or Alzheimer's and um, she has a few tips, some, some maybe some anecdotes and everything to help ease our minds around the care of our loved ones that are elderly and in uh, care homes. So let's listen to what she has to say now. Bless you. 
Oh, oh excuse me. Very good. Your sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. Is this something that is being recorded so that uh, you'll be showing this later to somebody uh, like like this? Or is it just you're looking for my information and you're going to write something up? Um, I'm going to record the sound. Um, and I will um, eventually write a blog post to go along with it. But I, uh, there's a lot of people out there who's parents are in homes and they can't see them and they yeah. are stressing about it <laughs> you know especially after like that one in Quebec um, how many people were found starved and they yeah because they, they need assurances absolutely now am I cutting out or is my internet okay you're fine it's probably me yeah. just cutting out a little bit. It's you then. Okay, yeah. I might turn, yeah. turn my video off so that I save the bandwidth. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so. Uh, I can do that as well. Yeah. Oh, I can turn off my video. Yeah, okay. so when we, get, when we actually get started, okay? Okay. All right. There we go. So, because my, my, sometimes my, my, um. Now, Michael, I just have to forewarn you. Uh, when I use Zoom. Karen, you there now? No, I'm here. Okay, you were forewarning me about you... Zoom. Uh oh, it's really uh, I'm one. You know what? I am here. Hmm. It, 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 give me a second. I'm going to send you uh, a phone number and we'll just do it via phone. Oh, okay. And, and I, I start to, to coach them. I, I always had a... Uh, if I would read somebody's uh, case, so to speak, then I would say. Okay. We'll use the magic of of of, of vetting it eventually here, and because I think we're just going to get a better go at it if I if we do the phone call. Oh, sorry. Did you send it? Uh... Oh. oh, let's see now. Where did that come through? Uh, great. I lost the connection here. I think I have too many things open too, so I don't know where where you went to, and my computer's slow all of a sudden. Uh, Michael, can you send me the link through base uh, uh, LinkedIn? Uh, somehow I, I've lost where the connection is for us. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna. I don't know how, you, how even to hang up on this thing. It's just. Oh wait, is that it? Ah, there it is. Okay, I I'll hang up because it's gonna have some background noise. So I'll just call you on the seven seven eight number. Uh, good. <laughs> Three eight nine. I can hear you every so often, but um, it's, yeah, it's really choppy. Yeah, it's cutting out too much. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just hang up here, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Karen. <laughs> oh, okay. It's Maybe good to see you're well, though. 
Yeah, I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm keeping uh, keeping busy, really busy. I uh, didn't think it'd be. I thought maybe I'd have a nice holiday time, but no. Nope. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Uh, so I might put my headset in. Maybe it might sound a little bit clearer for you on that end. Mm-hmm. One, two, three. You sound clear. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Yes, I can. Okay. And then, um, so so this is just around, uh, you just want to get my feedback on how people are doing and emotionally as family members yeah. uh, while their loved one is, is uh, mm-hmm. sort of away and not able to access them. Yeah. Yeah, because okay. it, it, um, that's the 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 family members um who like like another friend of mine um her her mom's at at home but she's trying to keep her inside and all that kind of stuff and she's it's like and my mother we we're, we've managed to to keep her inside uh back in philly and she's she's safe she's all that kind of stuff and i can call her and and everything but um there's some some other people that um, like in um, some of the some of the homes that, that we deliver papers to, that um, they're they're completely locked down, and the you know you can't go see see your see your parent or anything like that, and there's no way of of having there's a very limited communication. So we people need to need to know that everything is okay <laughs> in these places, right? Uh, just and in that, general, not yeah. a, not not a, yeah. not not a, not nothing specific, you know. So okay, so let me know when you plan to start to record, so that I can start tailoring my messages um, to the family. Okay, all right, and how about I'll just do a short introduction uh, to you as a dementia expert? How's that? Uh, sure, uh, Canadian. Maybe if you want to say, uh, is it mainly What's Canadian it? audience? Yeah. Yes, mainly Canadian audience. Yeah. Yeah, I usually say just a Canadian dementia consultant and educator. Cool. With twenty-five years experience in the field. Yeah. Okay. So well, I don't. I feel silly about the expert part, but uh, a lot of people say it, but I just feel silly because it's like we can never be a full, complete expert on anything. But no, you you. You're always you're you're always the student, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we've had that discussion before. You're always Did kind, we? Of, oh. the, kind of the student, yeah. But yeah, but expert assures people. I don't know. Uh, all right, it does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get started in five, four. Welcome back, everyone. I'm here today with Karen Tyrell, and she is the um, a dementia consultant. She has uh, been a key person in creating a certification for people who actually work with people with uh, with dementia in different homes and everything. Um, and she's here to talk to us uh, today about. Um, Things that you should know that because our our parents are locked away um, and it, they're just going to be okay because people like Karen are taking care of them and they're taking the right steps to make sure that that our loved ones are, are safe. So, um, Karen, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Michael. Yeah, this, this is hope- your third time third or fourth time that, that we've talked officially as an interview, right? <laughs> yes, it's always a pleasure to allow me to share my passion with your readers, your listeners. Yeah. And I will say you, you've you even written the book. It's actually, you've written two books, haven't you? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I published a, a book on cracking the dementia code, mm-hmm. which is around creative solutions to cope. With the changed behaviors we often see from people with dementia, and it, I also published with a um, the help of an illustrator a adult coloring, uh, which is like a therapeutic activity book for people in earlier 
to moderate stages of dementia. Wow. Which is actually coming in quite handy around this time. People are really uh, keen to have this book. Uh, There was a home actually in Ontario that ordered 40 copies uh, for their residents to stay active while they're in the isolation. So it was quite an honor to uh, support that care home. Okay. So how important is it that um, that our parents uh, right now stay active? Well, staying active for anyone is very important right now uh, for our physical and our mental health. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, there are people who are needing care and are in a care home at this this time of their life. And because of this pandemic that is going on in the world, things are on lockdown. We are not able to go visit these individuals in these care homes, which does put a huge uh, amount of emotions for both the families as well as that individual that's living in the care home. And when it comes to individuals affected by dementia, uh, it adds another layer of complexity because that person may not fully understand, they may continually forget why they have to stay in their rooms or why they can't have their families visit and they're continuously asking the staff or asking others, why isn't my daughter coming today? How come my daughter's not visiting? And that adds a lot of anxiety, a lot of confusion for these individuals. So it's not an easy time, and it's so sad to watch the families. Uh, actually, I say watch because uh, I, myself and my husband, uh, were quarantined. We were isolating ourselves um, purposely for over 14 days when this all started, but then realized we are able bodies, and there is a... Um, a retirement home that uh, reached out to me to say they were short-staffed and if I knew of anybody to help in either maintenance or just uh, regular day-to-day work. So I uh, volunteered myself and my husband and now we are going in and from my experiences supporting this retirement community, uh, I am seeing families come to the window and watching them with tears and uh, moments of joy just to see their loved one again and on the other side listening to that person uh, whether they have dementia or not uh, some some people do have symptoms of dementia Mm -hmm. inside this retirement home but some do not and just watching them go through that interaction between the glass is quite heartbreaking for me Uh, so it does bring a little moment of joy but it brings in that sadness that the feelings that I'm often hearing when I do talk with families over the phone or through Zoom is that helplessness, uh, that feeling of helplessness. They just can't do anything to get in there, to give them that hug, give them the comfort, to give them the reassurance. And so that's making it very hard for a lot of families right now. Uh, And of course, bad times when, let's say, for example, holidays or birthdays, like Easter just passed, a lot of families have their regular traditions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they couldn't go through those regular traditions this year, which made it really sad for a lot of people. Uh, So a lot of emotions, uh, frustration, too, that they can't uh, see the person or check in on them as regularly as they would like to. Um, But, uh, you know, there are some families getting creative. And what I'm I'm noticing is that those that did have access to the technology and the Wi-Fi, whatever building they are living in, um, are having better connections right now because uh, there is a tablet or phone in the room that people can do things like FaceTime or, um, you know, Messenger video, WhatsApp, uh, you know, Zoom, conferencing, Skype, those types of things. So they are able to see their loved one through that technology or the good old-fashioned phone. If the phone is in the room, they can still have those conversations. But unfortunately, with somebody that has more advanced stages of dementia, they may not know how to work the phone, how to call out, or even how to pick up the phone if, if there is a phone in their room. So therefore, those families are struggling the most to can maintain that, that contact. Yeah. Now, I, I know you dis, you described dementia like, like an onion that takes our minds back through time sort of thing um with 
the cell phone being what it is these days where you slide, you use a thumb to open it up and everything in comparison to um, when we were kids, um, you had to pick the phone. When you picked the phone up, it, would, it after it rang, there, there was somebody there. And right, right. It's, it's, so, it's, so, um, so somebody who has... Who, who has gone through so many stages of dementia, I can see not being able to use a cell phone. It's they will, they It may not stick in their head, right? Correct. It, it may be more difficult to understand what this device is because it's mm-hmm. not newer to them. And as you mentioned, I do use the memory onion analogy where a person that is affected by a progressive type of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease, often their memories of further back or are more strong as opposed to what happened just yesterday. So mm-hmm. if you picture the a big onion, I tell people sometimes people go backwards in that onion to years earlier in their life but cannot grab those memories that happened yesterday or last week. Uh, and eventually a person has only the memories of when they were young and they, they do ask for their parents, where are my parents? even though they are passed away and they do forget their family members or who their hu- their husband is. Um, they may not recognize their own husband with gray hair, but um, remembers him with the dark-colored hair mm-hmm. when they first got married, so those types of things. And so, yes, technology can be a challenge for some people. Um, actually, the sad part is even uh, the good old-fashioned phone, telephone, if it is in the room, there are cases where people with advanced dementia develop what's known as apraxia. And apraxia is just a condition where they don't know how to use familiar objects anymore. Mm. So whether it's working a microwave or working, you know, how to put coffee in a coffee machine, um, it goes down to not knowing how to pick up a phone and dial out or even in worse, you know, in, in later stages, um, a person doesn't know how to use their own toothbrush, what to do with it. So uh, praxia is very, a very difficult um, uh, condition that uh, caregivers have to deal with to support a person through their day-to-day. Uh, so these individuals would benefit from having support to utilize these instruments, uh, these devices, mm-hmm. to maintain that connection with family. But we're also in a situation where there are a lot of homes that are running short staff. Because if a person is sick within their building, they can't come in. So then we, we lose that, that body of, um, you know, that staff member to help out. And also with the regulations that came down several weeks back where if a person is employed in two different homes, they need to pick one and not to be traveling to both homes to maintain their full-time work. So instead of half time at one and half time another, they have to stay half time at the one. So therefore, the other home is now left short staffed, and this is the case of this retirement home that my husband and I are, are helping out in. Yeah. So short staff plus there's also situations where there's new regulations within that home, and for example, the one that I'm supporting. They, there never was a position for somebody to stand at the door and take temperatures of all the staff, you know, stopping visitors from coming in, accepting parcels, mm-hmm. but having to disinfect those parcels if they come through the door. And um, and I'll, I'll go on about those parcels in just a moment, but that's a new position as well as having to take temperatures of each resident sometimes twice a day just to make sure there's nobody starting with symptoms of the COVID and trying to catch that right away. So so those are new positions that are are required, um, not allowing more than two people inside an elevator to keep the social distancing. People in care homes may forget this. So having an elevator monitor be in controlling the elevator during mealtimes, uh, you know, so there's a lot more work going on in these homes that there's not enough time or staff to do the one-on-one connection of these devices for families. And so that's making it very frustrating for the families because I don't think they realize the full capacity of what's going on inside that building, the, uh, what, what might be happening. Each home will have its own challenges. Mm-hmm. Some are keeping the residents in, ev- in their own rooms 
others are inviting them to come down for meals, but only one person per table. So in the case of the place that I'm supporting, there's tablecloths for every table, and when that one resident finishes their meal, they have to go, um, you know, out to the elevator, and one at a time goes in the elevator with the person who's manning the elevator, and then the table gets changed completely over for the next person. So there's a lot more additional work, Mm -hmm. less socializing even inside for some of these residents because they're eating alone. Um, But the staff who are working in the dining room, you know, running off their feet, trying to help everyone, are doing their best to keep people smiling, keeping them feeling good. Uh, But it's not the same as what the family members can do. Well, yeah, that's that's very true. Now, last year, um, one of the the homes that that, uh, my wife and I, we we delivered to... um, they they had the Norwalk virus, and within a matter of hours. Now it's a little more extreme than, than COVID in some directions. Within a matter of hours, they the the virus had spread to eighty percent of the people in this place. So I'm I'm bringing this up because I want people who who are listening to understand how important it is to to make sure that. The social distancing stays in place even within the, the inside these inside of the homes because it can spread like like crazy. Just one person has it, and then wham, the whole the whole population of of the home or the facility has it now, right? Yes, and that's what's happening. Unfortunately, um, especially in the care home setting where the frontline care staff need to go to each room to help support the resident with their daily care tasks, Mm -hmm. whether it's using the toilet, getting changed, getting dressed, uh, you know, getting in and out of bed. Uh, Germs can spread from room to room that way if that staff member isn't uh, careful with, um, you know, hand washing, using the proper uh, protective equipment, um, and, uh, and, you know, there's also staff that have to go around now disinfecting all surfaces, handles. Uh, railing as much as possible uh, because if we do miss a person who is just starting to show symptoms and has touched three different things on that service and we miss that, um, germs can easily spread to the care staff who then can spread it to others. So um, some measures people are feeling are a little extreme. Um, in other cases, when I was talking to some of the, uh, the cognitively well residents, in this, this home, they're saying we're so appreciative because there has not been an outbreak in that home that of all the extra work and precautions that the home is taking, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, to have to go through this, it's a, it's a lot of, um, of uh, you know, the patience that's required, a lot of understanding uh, at this time, which can be hard to do, especially if people have poor reasoning skills, poor memory, uh, poor thinking abilities, as of those who who are diagnosed with with dementia, because they have those symptoms, so it's very difficult to to explain to the. I, I had one experience where a lady came to the dining room. She says, "I'm waiting for my friend. I'm going to stand here. I want to wait for my friend to sit with my friend," which she used to do prior to the COVID nineteen situation. And now she she it took a lot of convincing to encourage her to eat alone. Um, and uh, you know, because of my my skills and what I've um been teaching over the years, I used a little bit of my therapeutic reasoning technique on this woman, and I basically said to her, yep, as soon as I see your friend, I'll have her come to your table. Uh, So it got her to at least sit down and start her meal, um, you know, as as a technique uh, to help reassure her, even though, unfortunately, we weren't able to allow that to happen. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a really tricky time right now, and, and trying to um, uh, give some ideas to families is what I've been doing through a new Facebook group that was created for the family caregivers. And from in within this Facebook group, um, I've been also offering the free Zoom calls where we have the caregivers come together, ask questions, share their concerns, share their stories. And some of the stories I'm hearing is definitely heartbreaking Um, You know, people are just not understanding. But right about now, I think the support 
from others who understand, like, so from caregivers, family caregivers, to connect with other family caregivers right now uh, because that's going to help them get through. That's going to help them cope better, knowing that they're not alone and that there are other people going through the same challenges and learning from them what techniques they're using, what are they doing, how are they getting by, which has been a great peer support um, situation happening within our Facebook group. So I'm, you know, I'm happy to share that group if others want to join in. Uh, we are doing these weekly calls right now to help everyone. Mm-hmm on th- Thursday evenings um, as, as a way to support them and giving them some creative techniques and, and ideas. And one of them uh, that um, we shared in our last call is doing our best to keep that person in a positive mood as much as we can if they are connecting over the phone or over a technology, doing what we can not to just talk about the negativity of, I know you can't sit with your friends in the diner. I know I can't see you, and I'm sad I can't see you either, and I wish I can come see you, and it's so hard right now, this stupid disease and whatever, you know, like complain, complain, complain. It might just um, maintain that emotional memory a lot a, a lot longer after that the call has ended or the, the connection has ended, which then will not settle the person well for the rest of their day uh, and maybe a few days. So what I'm really encouraging families to do is to use the time, use the time while they're connecting to maybe sing some familiar songs, to maybe um, rehearse some prayers that they may know that comes easy to them. I feel as though if we do this for that individual, then it will help that individual when they hang up the phone to stay positive and to feel lighter on a happier note. And then the care staff will have an easier time dealing with um, their mood uh, and their concerns following the call. Um, so it's just a little tip is that maybe start the conversation and go through, yes, I know it's not there, I wish I was there. But then really changing up the conversation to something fun, reminisce about the good old days, uh, get some songs going, some prayers, whatever is going to be put that person in a happy mood. So then maybe after the call, that person might have what, what I remember hearing uh, called an earworm, and maybe they'll start to re-sing that song over and over <laughs> again afterwards, which will then maybe put other people in the care home in a good mood if they hear them humming that song again. So this is just an idea I'd like to share for families uh, to use during their connection time. So- so instead of griping about the uh, about the restrictions of the virus, do something to, to share to share the love the loving thoughts and everything. That, 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 hey, yes, that share the doing. loving thoughts. <laughs> yeah, share the loving thoughts. We do love you. We care about you and stuff. But move into something more um, meaningful in a way of you know singing a few songs to tap into another part of their brain. Um, you know, reminiscing about sometimes to laugh together, have some laughter, because singing and laughter, in my opinion, is so powerful. It's like a really, um, you know, powerful medicine for people affected by dementia that I've seen over the years. And I use those to my, um, you know, I, I pull them out of my back pocket every time I can with somebody who looks a little bit concerned, just to put them in a positive mood, as, as long, because those moods can stick uh, longer. So if a person is in a bad mood, that bad mood may stick longer. Um, but trying to change it up to a positive mood is, is our goal because we want that last emotion to, to stay longer. Hmm. That's a, I have to say that that's a brilliant idea. Oh, yeah, and now those families... I just wanted to say that isolation part around uh, items coming into a building, Mm -hmm. there are rules around families can deliver things, but it needs to go in isolation for five days in case there's any virus on that object. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, for example, um, it's not ideal to send perishable foods in right now because it might go in a fridge, but it might not be um, good when it comes out after five days if it's you know, bread or some kind of um, perishable item. But uh, they do put food in a fridge, but they do um, uh, have to keep it for the five days away from that person. So if a family member is able to 
uh, send a tablet or something that's easy to use. Now, there are devices out there for seniors that are easy tablets with very little items on it so they don't get confused. And the family can pre-program a tablet and then send it to the home. They'll put their name on it or the family can put the name on it. It goes into that isolation room for five days and then it can come back out. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. Uh, Some families might think, well, it's a long time, but actually five days is going by pretty fast nowadays. Uh, so perhaps look into uh, submitting a tablet, um, perhaps look into um, bringing them some coloring books or some, some coloring crayons, um, things to be active with. Um, there, you know, there may be uh, there's some other unique technologies out there that uh, could connect better with a family member, like phones that automatically answer for conversations, uh, like, a, you know, to make, make the cell phone go to auto answer so the person doesn't fiddle with buttons and how to turn things on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, have them use that device. Maybe an old device is hanging around the house somewhere um, that that didn't get traded up. Uh, then maybe give that to the family member right now, but just uh, uh, ask perhaps the staff to help set it up with the Wi-Fi so that there can be some FaceTime going on. That might be... Um, one way to keep connected to a family member during this time if the staff don't have the availability to. But a lot of care homes are having the recreation staff because they don't do group activities anymore. They are scheduling ahead of time with some of the families a uh, Skype call or some kind of um, call, FaceTime call, with uh, their loved ones, so it may be 3 o'clock on Thursday kind of thing. Uh, so they're trying their best to go around room to room, but there's still not a lot of staff that might be able to do that, especially if their home is, you know, 100 people or more. Yeah. So uh, that that is something to to, to keep in mind um, to family members listening that um, that the the homes are going to be short-staffed because there's other things that they have to do. Um, I'm sure... um, you you get screened into the, into the uh, into the facility. You're screened into the home where they 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 take yes. your thermo- they take your temperature yes. and yes. and and everything before you're allowed to enter, right? Yes, and, and that's another to... person that has to has to not do another job that they're supposed to do to do that as shift changes happen and everything, right? Yes, and actually that's one of the roles that I'm doing uh, by helping out in the home is taking the temperatures of everyone and the residents Mm -hmm. because that wasn't a position before. Um, But, uh, you know, some homes are getting creative. They're they're doing well. They were able to to manage all this. Um, Unfortunately, we know of the sad cases uh, in other provinces where there wasn't enough staff and um, which can bring a lot of fear right now and trust issues for current family members, let's just say here in BC, for example. Uh, we haven't heard anything like this yet, but it's, um, it's a real scare. And I can understand families are going to feel even more helpless if something like that happens. Uh, and there were actually um, uh, some, some people stating perhaps uh, we should have taken loved ones out of the care home before all this happened and bring them home to care for them. There's a lot of controversy around that issue. The, and the, what the, that one, I don't, I don't think we think we would be able to answer because um, because of the amount of debate that I don't think we'd be able to answer that question in, in the time period we have today. <laughs> That's no sure. worries, but, <laughs> but just but just I just want to say to the listeners, every case is going to be different, and not yeah. to listen to what mainstream is, and really examine your own case. It's a personalized situation, and just to note, a lot of people that have dementia when they're moved out of their familiar environment. Uh, they become more confused and more difficult to handle, and that might be something the family were, families weren't expecting. So it could cause more problems for families that way, yeah. um, with wandering away and that sort of thing. So uh, I encourage families to reach out for support. I know the Alzheimer's Society still has their 1-800 line, a helpline available if they want to go to the Alzheimer's Society of BC's website. Um, again, my Facebook group is called Dementia Solutions community for families okay so it's a private group just uh, dementia solutions 
community for families, and we're providing support there and the Zoom calls. Get as much support as you can. Reach out to your EAP if you have that, if you're still working and you have access to counselors. Um, I highly recommend doing that now more than ever for everyone's mental health. Thank you, Karen. No. You're and, welcome, Michael. As, as usual, you you you're always that 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 um that that I would say I'm not going to say the, the 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 ray of hope. You are always seem to seem to be like a a, a steady stream of hope. You know? Oh well, thank you. I you know I think when we're passionate about what we do, um, we we uh, we are making the world a better place. And I think everyone has their strengths and their um, abilities, and we're all doing our best to help and uh, out during a, a difficult time like yeah. this, including yourself. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, you take care. You too, and we'll. Um, and to everybody listening, thank you for listening. And if you have someone in a home, or you know somebody that does have someone in a home, um, share share the share this with them so that they they know that the people inside are actually doing the best they can to take care of their loved ones. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.